Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to look at what's called antiderivatives. So thus far in the course, we spent a considerable amount of time on differentiation or finding the derivative of a function and several applications involving the derivative and the first derivative and the second derivative. Now we're going to look at the second main problem to solve in calculus, which is called the area problem. And this is the first ingredient that we need, and they are called antiderivatives. So what are antiderivatives and why are they important? Well, suppose that a physicist knows the velocity of a particle, but they want to know the position of the particle at any given time. Remember that the velocity is the derivative of a position function. So we're trying to recover what the original function was if we know the derivative. Or you can have an engineer who knows how to measure the variable rate at which water is leaking from a tank. So they know how fast the water is leaking from the tank or the rate of change, but they want to know what is the actual amount of water leaked over a certain period of time. So again, they need to recover the original function. Or a biologist they know the rate at which the population of bacteria is increasing, but they want to know the size of the population of the bacteria at some future time. So again, they need to deduce the original function from the derivative. So in each of these cases, the problem is to find a function, capital F of X, whose derivative of capital F is the known function that we are given lowercase f of x. And if this function capital F of x exists, then it is called an antiderivative of lowercase f of x. So that's what this section is going to be about. So we're going to find what's called the general antiderivative for a given function. And then in the next video, we'll talk about differential equations, which involves finding the antiderivative and involving first and second order differential equations, how to solve them with given initial conditions, and then also how do you solve application problems that require you to find the antiderivative of a function. So let's look at the definition of antiderivative. The function capital F of X is called an antiderivative, not the antiderivative, it's an antiderivative of lowercase f of X on an interval I if the property is, if you take the derivative of this antiderivative, you get the original function f of x for all x values in this interval. So the process of recovering this capital F of x from lowercase f of x, its derivative, is called anti-differentiation. So we're trying to reverse the process of finding the derivative, so we're going to find the antiderivative now. Or as we go through this chapter, this is going to be related to what's called the area problem or integration. So let's do example one. Find an antiderivative for each of the following functions, and then we're going to note that there is more than one antiderivative for each of these functions. So number one, let's look at the function lowercase f of x is equal to 2x. So if lowercase f of x is 2x, this is already representing a derivative of some function. Our job is to recover the original function, which is called an antiderivative. So one possibility could be capital F of x could be x squared, since the derivative of the antiderivative is 2x, which is the original function. But you could also have capital F of x equals x squared plus 1 because the derivative of 1 will just be 0 and that's not appearing in lowercase f of x. Number 2. Let's try to find an antiderivative for g of x, which is 1 divided by x plus 2e to the 2x power. So again, this represents a derivative of some function and we're trying to recover that function which is an antiderivative. So it's common notation to use capital letters for antiderivative when your function is lowercase. So capital G of X 
would be, what is the function that gives you the derivative 1 divided by x? It's natural log, but in this case, x is any real number. So keep in mind that the natural log, it, the argument needs to be a positive value. So you need to include absolute value of x. It's not just natural log of x, because you cannot take natural log of a negative number, or 0. So make sure you put absolute value around the x, the argument. And then plus, what is the antiderivative of 2e to the 2x? Well, it's e to the 2x, because if you took the derivative of this function, capital G, and you take the derivative, you will get 1 divided by x for the derivative of natural log of absolute value of x, plus the derivative of e to the 2x is 2e to the 2x, because you have to use a chain rule. And this is the original function. So that works. That's one possibility. And again, you could also have subtract 3 at the end of an antiderivative because the derivative will just be 0 again. Number 3. Let's try h of x is equal to this polynomial. 3x squared plus 4x subtract 7. So again, the antiderivative and antiderivative would be capital H of x. The antiderivative of 3x squared would be x to the third, because the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. The antiderivative of 4x is 2x squared, because the derivative is 4x. And the, derivative, the antiderivative of negative 7 is negative 7x, because the derivative of negative 7x is negative 7. So that's because capital H prime of x is equal to 3x squared plus 4x minus 7, and that is lowercase h of x. So this is an antiderivative. Again, you can add any constant at the end and take the derivative. It will just disappear. Number four. How about lowercase j of x? Let's go to trigonometry. 2 times sine of 2x. So the antiderivative and antiderivative would be capital J of x. Now think about this one. What function's derivative would be 2 sine 2x? Well, it would need to be negative cosine 2x because the derivative of cosine 2x is negative sine 2x. So the negatives will cancel each other out to give you a positive. And then the derivative of the inside would be 2, and that's where that 2 comes from. Since j prime of x is equal to 2 sine 2x, which is lowercase j of x. And again, you can also add in or subtract a constant. Let's do one more. Number 5. This time, let's look at another trigonometric function. This time it's negative 3 cotangent x cosecant x plus secant squared x. So capital K of x for an antiderivative. Let's think about this. What function derivative would give you negative 3 cotangent x cosecant x? Well, negative 3 Well, 3 cosecant x, because the derivative of cosecant x is negative cosecant cotangent, and that 3 would just stay, and the negatives will cancel each other out. And then the antiderivative of secant squared is tangent, because the derivative of tangent of x is secant squared. Since k prime of x is equal to uh, lowercase k of x. So notice, again, that you can add in any constant that you want. These antiderivatives, these capital F, capital G, capital H, capital J, and capital K are not unique antiderivatives. They're just one possibility. So note that any antiderivative, any of the above antiderivatives, may 
contain a constant term. And this is what we were talking about earlier. You can have any constant term added or subtracted at the end of the any of these possible antiderivatives and could be an acceptable antiderivative. So this gives you an idea of what does it mean to have an antiderivative of a function. So we're going to state this observation that we've made from the previous example in terms of a corollary. A corollary is just a consequence of a theorem. So a corollary of the mean value theorem from the previous chapter, it gives us a method to find all possible antiderivatives of a given function. So in particular, we found out that any two antiderivatives of a function will differ by at most a constant term. So the theorem states, if capital F of X is an antiderivative of lowercase f of X, so it's an antiderivative, on an interval i, then the most general antiderivative of lowercase f of x on the same interval is capital F of x plus c. And this c stands for a constant term, any arbitrary real number or a constant. That's what the theorem states. So in other words, if you have f of x plus c, this is called the most general antiderivative, or sometimes people refer to it as a family of antiderivatives because it's a family of functions. They are all, they are all going to be just vertical translations of each other. So if you add or subtract a constant term, keep in mind that the graph will just be shifted up or shifted down in terms of the y values. So we can select a particular antiderivative from the family by assigning any specific value to C. And then we would know that the function passes through the given point on a curve. So here's an example. The original function for this problem or for this graph would be lowercase f of x is x squared. The family of antiderivatives or the general antiderivative is one third x to the third power. one-third x cubed because the derivative of one-third x cubed is x squared plus c where c is a constant. So if you take the derivative of a constant it will disappear because the derivative is zero. It will not even show up in your lowercase f of x. So this constant can be any real number. So if we have c equals zero then the graph will pass through the origin. It will be one-third x cubed plus zero. If you have c is equal to one, then that's just going to shift the graph up one unit. It will be one-third x cubed plus one, and the graph will pass through the y-axis at zero comma one. So your c can take on any, any real number, not just whole numbers. So let's try example two. We're going to find the antiderivative for each of the following functions. So it's very important this time to include the plus C because it's asking for the antiderivative, the general antiderivative. So number one, we're gonna also obtain some anti-differentiation rules along the way. So lowercase f of x is going to be x plus five times five x attracts six. So notice that there is not an antiderivative that's very easy to find of a product. So let's go ahead and multiply this out to find out what is this polynomial. So you'll find out it's 5x squared plus 19x and then subtract 30. 
So that is the lowercase f of x. And we need to find the general antiderivative. So this is going to be denoted by capital F of x. It is what is the function or what's the term that gives you the derivative 5x squared? It's 5x to the third divided by 3 because the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. The 3 will cancel out with a 3 and you'll have a 5x squared left. Plus the next term would be what's the antiderivative of 19x? 19x squared divided by 2 because the derivative of x squared is 2x and the 2's will cancel out and you'll have 19x left. And then the antiderivative of 30 is 30x. This is an antiderivative, but it's not the general antiderivative. To get the family of antiderivatives, you need to add on any arbitrary constant. So this c is a constant. And that is the general antiderivative. All antiderivatives will be of this form where c can take on any constant term, any real number. Okay, number two. So that wasn't too bad because it's a polynomial. Let's try lowercase g of x is equal to 3x to the 1 fourth subtract 7x to the 3 fourths. So this problem is going to be a little bit more difficult because we have to worry about what is the exponent going to be so that when you take the derivative, you get x to the fourth, 3x to the one fourth. And then if you take the derivative of the second term, you get 7x to the three fourths. And then we'll add on the constant at the end. So capital G of x will represent the family of antiderivatives. Let's think back to the last problem. We added one to the exponent to get the antiderivative of x squared. But then because the exponent became a three, if we take the derivative, we'll get 3x squared. The power will go down to the front because of the power rule. So we need a 3 in the denominator to cancel out that 3 from the power rule when we take the derivative. Let's use that idea here. We're going to keep the 3, just like we kept the 5 in the previous problem. But now we need to add 1 to the exponent. So 1 fourth plus 1. But then because the exponent becomes 1 fourth plus 1, you need a 1 fourth plus 1 in the denominator to help cancel out whenever you take the derivative to use the power rule. So now the next term, subtract 7, again will just be a constant, a coefficient, so it will stay. And now add 1 to the exponent on the 3 fourths, so 3 fourths plus 1, divided by, again, divide by the same exponent, whatever the exponent becomes, that's the denominator. And then, if you want the family of antiderivatives, tack on a plus c any arbitrary constant. So now, simplify. So 3, and then in parentheses, the power becomes x to the 5 fifths, 5 fourths, and then the denominator becomes 5 fourths. Subtract 7. The power on the second term becomes x to the 7 fourths, and then again, the denominator is also 7 fourths, plus c. Keep in mind, you have to have c on each applied by the reciprocal, so 3 times 4 fifths. Times x to the 5 fourths. Subtract 7 times the reciprocal of the 7 fourths is 4 sevenths. Times x to the 7 fourths plus c. And then simplify further. This is 12 fifths to find out the coefficients. x to the uh, 5 fourths. And then subtract 4x to the 7 fourths plus c, where c is a constant. So this is called the general antiderivative, or family of antiderivatives for lowercase g of x. All right, try one more, number three. Let's try some trigonometric functions. So this time, lowercase f of h of x is equal to cosine of x subtract 4 sine of x. Sine of x is cosine. And then the other term would be keep the negative 4. 
what's the antiderivative of sine of x? It would have to be negative cosine of x, because the derivative of cosine of x, so you'll need another negative to make it positive sine of x, plus c. So sine of x plus 4 cosine of x plus c, and again, c is a constant. The antiderivative, the general antiderivative. Make sure that you have plus c on each of these general antiderivatives. Okay, let's try three more. Okay, let's try three more before we get to the general rules stated. So number four, lowercase j of x is equal to six square root of x plus four cos. So notice from the previous three problems, we only had powers of x. So let's rewrite square root of x as a fractional power. It's six x to the half power plus four cosine of x. Okay, let's try three more before we get to the general rules. So number four, this time we'll look at lowercase j of x is equal to 6 times the square root of x plus 4 cosine of x. So remember from the, the first two problems, we only had powers of x. and We're going to rewrite square root of x so that we know what exactly the power of x is. It's x to the 1 half, and then we'll keep the second term 4 cosine of x. So now we have a way to figure out the antiderivative. The general j of x would be keep the 6, the coefficient, and then we know the rule from that if you have x to the half, the antiderivative is found by adding 1 to the exponent, same exponent. That way when you take the derivative using the power rule, your power will cancel out with the denominator and you'll be left with a 6. And then the antiderivative of 4 cosine of x is 4 sine of x and then add on the c. So then simplify to figure out what the coefficient for the first term is. So 6 times the power becomes x to the 3 halves, and then divide by 3 halves, plus 4 sine of x plus c. And this becomes, multiply by the reciprocal, you should get the original function lowercase j of x. Number five, this time lowercase k of x. We haven't tried any exponential functions yet. So let's try two thirds e to the negative two x power. So remember that for the derivative of exponential functions, you do not use the power rule. So if you want to find the antiderivative, you cannot add one to the exponents. That only works for powers of x where the power is a real number, not a variable. So this time, cap, then we'll find the antiderivative of e to the 2x. So the derivative of exponential functions are themselves. So the antiderivative of e to the negative 2x should be itself. Except, what's the derivative of the power? Negative 2. So you need to have a negative 2 in the denominator to help you cancel the 2 in the denominator to can cancel it out, plus c. And so this will simplify to negative 1 third e to negative 2 x. One more before we get to the general rules. So number 6, let's look at lowercase m of x. This time it's negative 3 divided by x plus 5. Or it could be rewritten as negative 3 times 1 divided by x plus 5. Or it could also be rewritten as negative 3 x to the negative 1 plus 5. Either way. 
So let's find the general antiderivative, capital M of x. So let's look at the middle expression. Keep the negative 3, the coefficient. What's the antiderivative of 1 over x? We did that one earlier. It's natural log of the absolute value of x because x is any real number. You want to make sure you have the positive value of x after the absolute value before you take the natural log. The antiderivative of 5 would have to be 5x because the derivative of 5x just gives you 5. And then we have a c for any arbitrary constant. So before we, move, we move, before we move on to the table of anti-differentiation formulas, there's one thing I want to point out. Let's say we rewrote 1 divided by x as x to the negative first power. And let's try to think about um, what would be the antiderivative if we added 1 to the exponent. Well, negative 1 plus 1 gives you 0. But then with all the other similar rules, we would have to also have to divide by 0, which cannot happen. So this is one of the unique rules where if you ever have x to the negative first power, the antiderivative is natural log absolute value of x. You cannot use the reverse power rule for that one. And again, I want to make a note that you need the absolute value. around the argument since x represents any real number. Okay, so now we have an idea of how to find antiderivatives with these six previous problems. Find the general antiderivative. Always remember the plus c. Otherwise, you're just finding an antiderivative, not the family of antiderivatives. So from the previous examples, we found out several differentiation formulas that we could use to reverse the process of one possible antiderivative. So if we have a coefficient times a function, we always kept the coefficient and we found the antiderivative of lowercase f of x, and it was capital F of x. If we had derivative of each term separately, if we had x to some power, as long as the power was not negative 1, you could add 1 to the exponent, and then you only had e to a power, the antiderivative was itself, the antiderivative of cosine of x was sine of x, the antiderivative of sine of x was negative cosine of x, um, secant squared, the antiderivative would be tangent, sec antiderivative of secant of x, and the last two we haven't seen yet, but these are for the inverse trigonometric functions. Make sure that you know each of these anti-differentiation formulas. Make sure that you know each. Then you can just try to guess and then check. Same thing with antiderivatives. You can use these rules to find the antiderivative rather than guessing what the integer would be and then having to check it every time using derivatives. Last comment before we get to example three is that each of these differentiation rules in the table, you can always verify them using a differentiation formula. So you can always check your answer. So in every single case, you can have a plus C on each of these antiderivatives and you'll find the general antiderivative representing all possible antiderivatives of the given function. So in this case, in this table, all the constants are zero. And then one last comment. You can always check your answer. Check your antiderivative is correct by taking the derivative. and checking to see if the definition is true. Capital F prime of x equal to lowercase f of x. 
So it may not seem feasible to check your answer every time, but you have a way to make sure your answers for the general antiderivative are correct using differentiation. Okay, let's move on to the last example in this video. We are going to use the anti-differentiation formulas in the previous table to find the antiderivative for the following functions. This without looking at the table every, every single time. So number one, let's look at lowercase f of x is equal to square root of x times 10x plus 6. So this is the function that you already have taken the derivative of. So this is the derivative. We're going to recover the antiderivative. So again, make sure you multiply this out so we identify exactly what the power of x's are. You'll have x to the um, 3 halves plus 6x to the half after you distribute. Now we're the family of antiderivatives, or the general antiderivative. We know that this is x to a power, and the power is not negative 1. So we can use the reverse power rule. Keep the coefficient add 1 to the exponent, and divide by the same exponent. So 3 halves plus 1 in the denominator. Keep the coefficient, add 1 to the exponent to find the antiderivative, and let's move to the next term. Keep the coefficient, and then add 1 to the exponent, so 1 by that same exponent, 1 half plus 1. And then we are finding the antiderivative, so remember the plus c at the end. So now the rest times, the first term will be x to the 5 halves divided by 5 halves. And then the second term becomes 6x to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves, and then plus c. So it looks like the family of antiderivatives will be 10 times 2 fifths after you multiply by, the, multiply by the reciprocal, and then 6 times 2 thirds times x to the 3 halves plus c. So the first term becomes 4x to the 5 halves. Second term becomes 4x to the 3 halves, and then plus c, where c is an arbitrary constant. You do not need to read ours back to radicals. You can leave it as fractional powers in your antiderivative. And keep in mind that you can check your answer by taking the derivative, and you should get lowercase. All right, this time we're going to do g of x, which is given in um, a rational function form. So x to the fourth plus 4 square root of x, and this is divided by x squared. So just like there was not a reverse rule for the product rule, there is not a reverse rule for the quotient rule either for antiderivatives. We need to simplify this function to identify what the power of x's are. So the first fraction would be x to the fourth divided by x squared, and the second fraction would be 4 square root of x also divided by x squared. So break it back apart into two fractions with the same denominator. Simplify each fraction, so x squared, plus the other fraction becomes 4x to the negative. Now find the antiderivative. So capital G of x would be the antiderivative x squared is add 1 to the exponent, divide by the exponent, which would be 3. Move on to the next term, keep the coefficient 4, add 1 to the exponent, so negative 3 halves plus 1, and then divide by um, negative 3 halves plus 1, and then remember the plus c, because we found the antiderivative, and then simplify. So the first term is 1 third x to the third, or x cubed divided by 3, and the second term becomes 4 times x to the negative half, negative half plus c, and so this is 1 third x cubed minus 8 x to the negative half plus c. 
And you can rewrite this ne x and negative half as a fraction. So capital G of x is 1 third minus 8 stays in the numerator, but x to the negative half is really square root of x plus c. And c is any arbitrary constant again. Or you can just leave your answer as it was. 1 third x cubed minus 8 x to the negative half plus c. One or the other. Okay, let's try a third problem, number three. Again, we're going to start off with a function that is a fraction. So it's x to the fifth, subtract x cubed, plus 6x, and this entire function, or entire numerator, is divided by x to the fourth. So we're going to approach this the same way as the last problem. Rewrite the function into three separate fractions, x to the fifth divided by x to the fourth, minus x cubed divided by x to the fourth, plus 6x over x to the fourth again. Simplify each term, so x, subtract 1 divided by x, plus 6 divided by x, or you can also have x minus x to the negative 1, plus 6x to the negative 3. That way we have each power of x identified. The antiderivative, so capital H of x, the antiderivative of x squared, so it's x to the first power, so you can still use the reverse power rule. Add 1 to the exponent, divide by the same exponent. But keep in mind, for the second term, you cannot do that because if you add 1 to the exponent, it becomes 0, and you would divide by 0. This is that unique rule because it's really 1 divided by x. The antiderivative is natural log absolute value of x. And keep the sign between the antiderivatives. Plus 6, keep the coefficient. And then this last term, you can add 1 to the exponent. So negative 3 plus 1 divided by negative 3 plus 1. And then we found the antiderivative, so add c. Do a little bit of simplifying. You have 1 half x squared, subtract natural log, absolute value of x, and then this last term becomes 6 times x to the negative 2, divided by negative 2, plus c, and so it looks like the general anti antiderivative would be 1 half x squared, subtract natural log, absolute value of x, minus 3, x to the negative second, 1 half x squared, Subtract natural log of x, and then subtract 3 divided by x squared plus c. By moving x to negative 2 or more, and we're going to look at trigonometric functions again. So number 4 is lowercase j of x is equal to 2 times secant 2x tangent 2x plus 3e e to negative 4x. We're going to find the general antiderivative of each term separately. So we have a trigonometric function followed by an exponential function. Now think about the antiderivative of secant 2x tangent 2x. The antiderivative of secant tangent is secant of x. So it looks like it's secant 